Okay, it's seven o'clock in the evening in Finland, so I think it's time we start. And it's uh, uh, something entirely else in wherever you're watching this one. But uh, it's great to have you all listening over there. I hope we have a fruitful session about remote learning and about best practices for remote ma math teaching. Uh, before we start, some practical things. Uh, Last time we had this seminar, we had some minor network difficulties time to time. So if it happens again, if I drop out, then just wait patiently. Usually it doesn't take that, that long to to fix the fix the connection, but that's perfectly possible. Uh, also, if you haven't joined the WhatsApp group for questions and support, please do it before we start. I mean now, because we're going to start start right away. There's the address on screen. And uh, whatever questions you have about the presentation or around the presentation, or if you want to know more about some of the things I'm saying here, just send questions to WhatsApp. There are our lovely people there who will answer you as soon as possible. And uh, also, if you're interested in trying out some of the practices we're going to discuss today, you can use the other link, which gives you access to Edit and Playground which is uh, a system we're going to use as a demo in the second half of this presentation. So I'm first going to talk about, in general, about best practices, and then I'm going to show uh, how you can utilize some of those or some of those best practices yourself. So you can also uh, enroll into Edit and Playground. If you do the sign up, you will get the recording for the seventh sent to you. Uh, and uh, even if you don't, you can access this seminar later in our YouTube channel. So glad to have you all on board. And I think it's time time we actually start start this presentation. In a second, sorry. This is one of the technical difficulties I was talking about. Anyway, <clears throat> I'm in Finland and uh, it's uh, I think it's a good good idea to start with saying greetings from Finland. Uh, there are some, I think, somewhat stereotypical images. You probably Imagine when you think about Finland, we're a tiny country there next to Russia in Northern Europe. Uh, it's actually, the summer is actually starting in Finland, so there isn't any snow or ice anymore. There, there are some leaves on trees and uh, it's getting really nice. The image in the middle, down in the middle, is from our hometown, Turku. That's where I am at the moment giving you this presentation. And of course, the Santa Claus, because as all Finnish people know, Santa Claus is actually from Finland, not from North Pole. So let's let's get that thing straightened out right away. Uh, <clears throat> I'm hosting this presentation. My name is Erki uh, Paila. I'm the head of research in Edison. I also hold a position in University of Helsinki. I uh, teach programming and study digital learning and uh, learning analytics and uh, digital pedagogy, all things related to digital pedagogy. Usually we give this presentation with my co-host, Eka Kurvinen, who's the head of pedagogy in Edmonton. Uh, <coughs> Einari, or Eikka, isn't here today, uh, but there's a really good reason. Eikka and, and his wife just got their first baby, like less than two weeks ago. So he's busy doing something else, and uh, I'm going to be hosting this session for you. So I, I'm sure you all all join me to say good luck to Eka and his wife for for new member of the family. And uh, once more, I saw you this slide and see that there are a lot of people joining joining all the time. Just take a quick screen cap or or I don't know, use your camera to take a picture and join the WhatsApp group. You can ask whatever questions you want about the presentation or anything around around the presentation. Whatever you want to know more about, just dropping a question into in WhatsApp. There are people there who are waiting to answer your questions. Okay, but let's get to actual <clears throat> actual topic of today, which is uh, the transformation to remote learning. And uh, I think this has been uh, a really sort of big topic in the last eight weeks, if I'm right. Days go so fast, fast now, so it's sort of difficult to say. But anyway, we all faced uh, in education, almost all people faced a, a whole new situation eight or nine weeks ago, uh, because we needed to do a really quick transformation to remote learning. Uh, and I think in general, if we compare 
countries, we did it quite well in Finland. And uh, I think one of the things I'm going to talk about today is uh, how we did the transformation and what kind of things are important when you're doing the transformation to remote learning, whether it's because of the COVID virus or whether after the virus, when things get back to normal, what kind of benefits you can still get from remote learning. But I think uh, one of the things which was sort of essential in Finland when doing the transformation was something we call SISU. And uh, it's a bit difficult to translate, but uh, in general, it's, it means something like an, something that enables extraordinary action to overcome mentally or physically challenging situation or a fire that burns through anything or, or something like that. What it means is that Finnish people, when they start something, they want to complete that as well. It's a, it's a really difficult thing for, for Finnish people to encounter a problem we can't solve. And I think that was the mentality when we started to really quick transformation to remote learning. Most of the teachers in Finland, most of the students in Finland had no previous experience of remote learning. There were a lot of things people needed to learn and really quickly because you couldn't have, you couldn't wait for a week or two or anything like that. We needed to keep the schools on go, going on uh, and we couldn't have the people in the same location. So there was something we needed to do real quickly. And uh, I think that was sort of like a mentality needed. It was something that needed to happen and then we made it happen. And uh, we made it happen quite successfully. And uh, today I want to talk about some of the things you need to consider when you're, when you're doing the transformation yourself. Actually, that, that image before we move on is uh, from the wife carrying championships. So that's a Finnish sport as well. Okay, if we talk about in a nutshell how the remote learning works, and let's not get into details. Yes, let's let's not think about the actual like applications or or systems or, or tools or anything like that, and not in the topics. But what is like the basic structure of remote learning? And uh, this excellent slide by Mr. Harpo Penka sort of defines it in four steps. So. Uh, there needs to be some kind of instruction or introduction where the teacher presents the current topic and sets the goals. And uh, this is something each day should start. Uh, so there, there should be at least one of these sessions each day or these instruction sessions, maybe even more, depending on what you're doing. But that's, that's like the start, setting up clear goals. Uh, then there need to be some kind of exercises, something that activate the students, something that students can work on work on, on their own or in small groups, in pairs, however you want to do it. But something to keep them actively learning, which is, of course, essential in all education, but which is specifically essential when you're doing remote learning. Uh, but the exercises alone are not enough. Uh, there needs to be feedback and guidance, something that tells the students whether they got what they were doing right or wrong and how they could improve their performance, what they could do better and uh, especially what, what things they did really well. Like the positive feedback is really important. Again, this is something that happens all the time in the classroom. You all know that teachers give a lot of feedback in the classroom. That's like a normal setup, but uh, it's something we can't forget when we're working remotely and it's easy to forget. So. It doesn't work if you just give the students a bunch of exercises to complete and then that's all. Then you wait for the next day or, or next week and see if the exercises were completed or not. You need to give uh, constant feedback and constant guidance. See if the students are having problems, help them with, the, with their problems. Those are all really important things. Then the final phase, which is uh, again, maybe sort of a difficult one, in, in remote learning, the number four, the application. And uh, again, it's an important one because you're learning skills so that you can actually apply them, apply them to something, something useful and something real. So you're not just learning things because the teacher says that you need to learn them, but you need to have some kind of justification why to learn those things, why it's important to know this thing in mathematics. How can you use this in, in whatever you're going to do in future? 
And uh, <clears throat> I think it's important to realize that there can't be shortcuts from phase one to phase four. So you can't just give the instruction or introduction or or a video lecture or anything like that, and then assume that the students can immediately apply apply the knowledge somewhere. They need to be able to exercise it to practice it and then get feedback and and then we can maybe hopefully reach the learning goals we are aiming for. Uh, <clears throat> so let's think about some things we actually which are sort of important, which are sort of crucial in remote teaching. Uh, and these are things we've been we've been talking with Finnish teachers a lot during this uh, remote teaching period. Uh, and uh, these are sort of the things a lot of the teachers agree, or most of the teachers agree, that are important over there. So uh, the first one is setting clear goals. Uh, and again, this is definitely more, even more important in remote teaching than it is in school, because it's sort of typical that you have a lot less time with your students. You, are, you're, you won't be able to be there all the time to tell them what to do, how to do it. So it's important that you sort of justify what you're learning in the, and uh, set clear goals. These, these are the things you need to complete during this day or during these two hours or during this week, whatever the time period is. Uh, and the important thing to realize is that different students may need different goals. Again, something I, I learned when I talk, talked with uh, a friend of mine who's a, who's a teacher, an elementary school teacher, and uh, what he said that when, when the whole remote thing started, he quickly realized that if he has a, a preset goal and the same goal for every student, and he gives those goals, sort of announces those goals in the beginning of school day, then one of the, or some of the students return day or submit their work like in 30 minutes or an hour, and uh, some of the students won't be able to complete their work during the whole day or maybe even two days or something like that. And uh, you all realize that that might be really bad thing for motivation. If, if you're working on something too easy or something too difficult, that's not motivating. That's, that's not something that keeps you on, on going and keeps you on, on practicing that thing over and over again. So differentiation is important. If someone is good in some topic, set uh, more difficult goals, more challenging goals for them. And if someone is probably like uh, not as good, then they probably need less challenging goals to keep, keep the things motivating. <clears throat> so number one, and uh, number two is the gamification. And there's been a lot of talk about gamification in all education. I don't know if you're, you're actually impounded it yourself, but gamification is an important tool in any, any education. And uh, why, it's in, why it's so important, it's again, it's about those goals. So if you set goals, it's important that you also set some kind of way to find out whether you have reached the goal or not. And uh, even better, if you can somehow visualize how close you are to the goal you're trying to reach. So whether you completed like 50% of the task or, or 75% or one third or something like that, but something the students, where the students can see that they're actually progressing, that they doing something with something meaningful and they getting towards the goal the teacher has set. So again, this is, this is really important. And uh, the things, the tools we use in gamification to engage students uh, are typically something like trophies, uh, progress bars, or some kind of whatever kind of meters we can use to display the progress to students, some kind of virtual awards, anything like that. Whatever we can use to keep the students in, more engaged in the task they're doing, because that's, what's, what, that's what the trophies do, even the virtual trophies and virtual progress bars do that because they visualize your progress, they show you how far you got already, and that motivates you to get even further. And, and you see the goal is approaching slowly. So it means that it's, uh, you're seeing that your work is actually, actually doing something. It has an effect. Uh, <clears throat> number three in our list is uh, analyze and act. And now, again, this is really important in... Uh, remote learning uh, because 
again, when you're in school with your students, it's easy to see where everyone is going. It might be, might be. I mean, at least it's easier, easier to see. And uh, for students, it's it's easy to ask for assistance if they don't know something. It's easy to ask questions if they're they're lost somewhere. And it's easy for you to see if someone is, is struggling with with some topic or anything like that. But when the students are doing their work remotely, you have a li really little uh, FaceTime with any of the students, and that's even if you do that's over some kind of internet connection, some kind of some kind of web tool. And that's why it's important to follow the progress as closely as possible. And uh, for that, it's really whatever tools you're using, I strongly recommend that you pick the kind of tool that has good enough learning analytics tool, something that provides you information on each student's progress. Something like this student has done this many exercises like this, and even more importantly, this student is struggling with this topic and this student is maybe struggling with this topic and this student is maybe doing really well on this topic, maybe so well that he or she needs more talents, again, to keep the things motivated. Uh, and uh, the analytics is only useful if you actually follow the analytics. So it's important that you pay attention on what's happening over there and you do it regularly. I mean, once a week is definitely definitely not enough, something you need to do constantly all the time to see how the students are doing. And then it's, of course, important that when you find out that the student is having some, some sort of difficulties over there, that you offer assistance and help as soon as possible. Because one of the things to realize is that students, especially the science students, the ones uh, uh, it's a lot easier to ask for resistance in classroom when the teacher is right over there. You walk past them. It's easy to say that, that I'm, I'm, I'm struggling in this exercise. I need some help with this exercise. Uh, it might be a lot more difficult if you need to do it by calling by phone or using whatever means you're using. So the communication is also something you need to do as easy as possible, but it helps a lot if the teacher can actually follow the progress on their own and then offer assistance when needed. Then number four, uh, <clears throat> now remote teaching, as we have realized, as you have realized before, is, is really easy to sort of like normal classroom work. Uh, and uh, there's nothing, nothing wrong in that, but uh, if the, when things are too difficult, that might sometimes have a negative effect on learning and, and negative effects on, on sort of sort of work ethics and things like that. And uh, things you can make to keep keep uh, a situation a bit more under control is to keep up routines. And uh, I think a good idea is to keep as many as the routines you have normally. So if you start each day in your classroom at let's say eight o'clock by doing something. I don't know, whatever it might be, by by seeing what the, st the students, what kind of tasks they completed the previous day, or or I don't know, if you sing a song or or whatever you do, do that also when you're teaching remotely, if it's possible. Something that keeps the something that's familiar for students, so that they sort of have like a mental image that this is still schoolwork and this is still sort of similar to. The schoolwork we do at classroom, even if we're doing this remote, even if you're not in the same same location than my classmates or, or my teacher is. Uh, and uh, well, since not all routines can be kept the same, it's also, I think, important to come up with uh, new routines. So again, if you think about the four steps or sort of basic steps in remote teaching, for example, the, if you give an introduction to the new topic, at same time each morning and uh, in a similar session or something like that. That's important. That's something that's also at safety to students or gives students the sense of safety that things stay the same. It's uh, creating a safe environment for students. Uh, also, it's uh, really important to stay on schedules and keep the students on schedules. And uh, because again, it's really easy to do something else. When you're, when you're working remotely, when the students are working remotely, uh, it's really easy to sort of 
instead of working on your school topics to do something else, play a game or, or go outside to play or, or whatever that might be. So it's important that you set goals and you set straight goals and you set schedules like this is the work you need to complete by tomorrow and, and so on. Now, uh, there are a lot of great tools for remote teaching and, and this list is by no means comprehensive. So there are definitely other tools in addition to this list over here. Uh, there are some important things I think you need to consider when you're selecting tools, we're going to talk about that in a minute. But uh, if you think about the tools needed for remote teaching, remote learning, uh, there are at least these three categories. We need some tools for video conferencing, so something you can use, for example, each morning when you set the goals for the day and when you chat with your students and uh, you get sort of uh, all the students in the sort of the same virtual place where hopefully they can also talk to each other and, and, and they can tell what they did in the day before and things like that. And uh, most of these tools can also be used to, or I, I think all of those tools and most of the video conferencing tools, conferencing tools can be used to talk with just one person at a time. So you can also have like uh, conferences with just a single student, which might be useful as well. Then you need some general tools uh, for sharing materials. Google Apps works greatly for that. Google Apps for Education uh, or Microsoft Offices or whatever you're familiar. If, you, if there's something you have been using before, then that's probably your best bet for, for sharing materials and for video conferencing. If there are tools your school offers, those are probably the ones you should use. For the other tools, these are probably the ones you have uh, less experience about. And uh, now I'm talking basically, for example, about tools that enable practicing the topics on your own. And we're going to show, I'm going to show you an example of one of these tools, the tools we've been working on later on the second half of this half of this presentation today. But again, I think it's important if there are tools you have been using successfully in classroom, and if you if those tools can be adapted to use remotely, then at that, that should be at least your starting point. Start with something you know how to use because there's going to be a lot of cognitive load on students, a lot of new things they need to learn. There's going to be a lot of cognitive load on you, a lot of new things the teachers need to learn. And uh, if you can decrease that even a bit, if you can make things a little bit easier for some point, then I think that's definitely something you should do. Uh, We've collected some things you should consider when you're selecting a tool, some things that are essential to select a proper education tool. And uh, if you go through the list, uh, the first one is that you need a tool that contains enough good quality content which supports your curriculum. Uh, I'm going to tell you straight away that if you, if you try to create all the content yourself for your remote teaching, that's probably not going to work out. Uh, constructing pedagogically valid uh, content for remote teaching, teaching really takes a lot of time. And as we mentioned before, there's going to be a lot of new things you need to adapt anyway. There's a lot of your time is going to go to instructing students and, and designing new kind of lessons and things like that. So you probably won't be able to create at least all the content yourself. So I think it's a good, good idea to try to find a tool that contains enough good quality content and, uh, of course, a content that supports your curriculum because that's the kind of content you're going to need when you're teaching, teaching remotely. Uh, on the second, second bullet point is uh, selecting a tool which is built on solid pedagogical principles. Uh, and what, what, I, what I want to say with this one is that if you browse internet for example you will find a lot of these sort of learning games the games in quotes because uh, a lot of or they are games but learning in quotes let's let's do it that way uh, so uh, a lot of those games have really no pedagogical value a lot of those games don't teach practically anything they can be entertaining and the students are probably willing to play them uh, but if they are not actually designed to support real pedagogical principles and to actually teach something, then playing them has no added value at all. 
Uh, and uh, connect it on that. If you have a tool that is built on solid pedagogical principles, then it's also going to be a tool that provides valid evidence-based learning results. So something you can, something that sort of proves that this one actually works. If your students are using this tool, then they are actually learning something. And uh, to validate whether they are learning something or not, you need the learning analytics we discussed before. Uh, and uh, as much learning analytics as possible, but easy to understand learning analytics are, are crucial as well. Something that displays to teach uh, how well the students are doing and whether they are having problems with any of the topics and something which also displays the students themselves, how well they are doing and uh, what they are concentrating on and, and how they are progressing and, and all those kind of things. Uh, then it's also important to select a tool which is easy enough to adapt and use immediately. Again, I, I mentioned the concepts of cognitive load, which uh, if you're not familiar with the concept, what it means is that uh, whenever you need to learn something new, we call that the cognitive load. And uh, if you're learning mathematics, for example, and if you need to learn to use a tool before you can start learning mathematics, that's like additional cognitive load. So instead of learning mathematics, you're learning to use the tool. And that's that's not the point. If you're having a mathematics lesson, you're supposed to learn the mathematics. And uh, that's why it's again, it's important to select a tool which is easy to use. Luckily, students are, are usually sort of fluent in adapting new technologies. And at least they should be sort of like brave enough to try new things and so on. But still, there are systems there which, which can be way too difficult for, for some students to use. It may also mean that you will be spending a lot of time in answering the same questions over and over again, which again means that that's time you could be, as a teacher, doing something entirely different. The final point in selecting a tool is uh, it's a really good thing if a tool provides a good communication channel between school and home. Uh, in the last slide, when we talk about tools, I mentioned that there are there are plenty of these sort of communication tools. But if there's some built-in communication tool in your learning system, it's all always sort of easier to discuss, for example, about the exercises or or whatever material there is in the tool. And uh, again, the communication between school and home is really important when the students are working remotely because you're not going to have those daily chats with them in the during the during the lectures or or during the recess or anything like that. So uh, there needs to be a clear and easy to use way to talk to your students and to your students to talk to you and tell them if they are having problems and uh, whatever whatever they might require. Okay, something we've been working on in, in Edison uh, is a concept called Finland math. Uh, and the idea is that we isolated six of the most important thing, things in Finland math education. And uh, we've been actually writing a couple of guides. There's actually a new one, new one coming in a month or two about how to utilize this Finland or these Finland math principles in your classroom. And a lot of these principles, or actually all of these principles, are designed so that you can utilize them in a classroom or when you're teaching remotely. And uh, if you're interested in, take a, like in taking a, uh, a more detailed look on this, you can download these guides free of charge from our website, edutzen.com. Uh, but the things we're sort of realized why, why the Finnish math, math education is so successful. It's uh, sort of concentrated on these six things, the stress-free learning, trying to keep the environment as stress-free as possible, uh, deep understanding and creative problem solving. So instead of, of, of having such superficial calculations, we try to provide more deeper knowledge. Uh, Student-centered learning, so it's all about student. The student should be in the center of the whole learning process. And the personalized learning, something we talked about before, for example, offering suitable skill level content for, for different students. If someone is really good in something, then provide more difficult tasks for that student. And if a student is not as good, 
then maybe provide easier tasks. Uh, also, more time for teachers and focus super for students are important things. And again, that's one of the key points in Finland math to free teachers' time so that you can do something actually beneficial instead of, for example, assessing the exercises yourself and then the growth mindset, which is if you try to facilitate the growth mindset, the idea that the students believe in themselves and, and think that they can get to be better, better people, better persons, more motivated persons, then you can definitely get better learning results. Uh, okay, before we start the second half of the presentation, where I talk about the practical application of some of the things I've, I've been presenting in the first half, again, if you join this presentation, and a lot of you joined this presentation just a while ago, uh, just pick the first address in there and uh, join the WhatsApp group for questions and support. And if you want to try the system yourselves in the second half, when I show you the demonstration, you can also sign up for a free account to try the system. Okay. And then... So, uh, what I want to do next is to show you how you can utilize a system designed for remote learning, which is built on a lot of those principles I present, presented in the first half. And uh, what I want to say in this, this point is that this is by no means the only system capable of, of some of these things. And as I said before, if you're using a different system, then that's perfectly fine. I hope you still uh, managed to get something out of the presentation in the first half, the same principles concern whatever platform you're using. But I want to show you a demonstration on, on Edit and Playground because it's really easy to use and you can try it free of charge yourself and you can see how, how the principles of remote learning actually work with your own classroom. The idea is that, is that uh, it's a gamified exercise-based platform. It will show, you, show it to you in a minute and there's a full mathematics curriculum for ages 6 to 15, or grades from 1 to 9. It's built on the Finnish mathematics curriculum, but you can customize it yourself to suit basically any curriculum in mathematics anywhere around the world. Uh, it's a web service, so you can access it in the internet. You can use your desktop computer or tablet device, whatever your students are familiar using, again, less cognitive load if you keep on using the same same devices you've been using before. Also, I think it's sort of obvious that if the students, if you look at the infrastructure or the devices the students have at home, it's going to be a really like uh, diverse selection. They have a lot of different devices. That's why it's important, again, that you pick a platform that works with as, as many different devices as possible, unless you're provi providing the devices yourself. Uh, so, some things I mentioned before about uh, selecting a tool with evidence-based learning results. And uh, if we talk a little bit about the history of Edison Playground, it's, it's something we have been building in university for more than a decade and uh, later in Edison as well. And uh, all the design and implementation of the system has been research-based. So, Whenever we have come up with new features or new kind of exercises or new content, we've been testing it in Excel setups and uh, and uh, research setups where we have a control group that, that used mathematics, did the mathematics like traditionally, and then the other group, the treatment group that used Edutem Playground, and then we had some done some scientific testing to find out if the features work. If the features work, then we keep them in the system. If they don't, then we try on something else. And uh, we've been doing a lot of these studies around the world. Here are some results. This is from Lithuania, which we did in spring 2018. Uh, the study lasted for 15 weeks, and the idea was that we had two groups. The first one used pen and paper, like traditional way to calculate math. They had like exercise books, and then they used pen and paper to, to do the calculations like you normally learn math. And then the other group used the Edison Playground and the digital exercises over there. And uh, if you look at the numbers over there, I think they sort of speak for themselves. 
there was uh, the group using the digital system had a 39% improvement uh, against the control group in mathematics performance and 45% uh, improvement uh, for, for to mathematics fluency. So if you compare it to control group, you see that there's a huge difference. And uh, so this is actually evidence that the system works. And as I said before, this is something you should, whatever tool you are using, this is something you should look for. Some kind of valid evidence that shows you that the tool you are using actually provides learning results. That's, that's important. Uh, and uh, as I said, said before, we've been doing a lot of these studies and uh, all of these studies uh, so similar kind of results. So for example, this one, done in United Arab Emirates uh, with four, four schools and seven, more than 700, almost 800 students for six weeks. Again, uh, we found out that uh, the students using the digital system uh, improved their performance a lot, more than 20%, and the number of mistakes they made decreased by 164 Four percent, which are these are actually great numbers because this was used for six weeks, and six weeks is is a really short time. And uh, if you can find a tool which provides you these kind of changes sort of quickly, then I think it's it's a good idea to at least try it. Uh, and uh, one important thing in in whatever pedagogical tool, especially math tool, you're going to select is, and one of the things I mentioned that you should look for for in any tool is the amount of content. And uh, you should have enough content. And the Khan Academy, which which uh, is it has a lot of really valid materials and things like that. But if you look at the number of tasks they have available for math, it's like 24 weekly tasks available. And 24 tasks a week is probably not enough when you're trying to learn a new concept in mathematics. Uh, and if you look for in, in comparison, the editor numbers. Uh, in average, the students complete something like 260, more than 250 tasks each week. This is also one of the reasons why the students using the Edison Playground or using digital systems usually outperform the control groups that are using pen and paper because you can calculate so much more. And uh, you can calculate so much more, but you also get like meaningful feedback. Uh, and uh, freeing teachers' time was one of the key points in Finland math pedagogy. And uh, again, using digital tools may provide you this. For example, if you're using Edison Playground, it means that you're not doing as much uh, paperwork and not as much testing because the system does a lot of that for you. Uh, so whenever the students are working on a systems, when they I actually saw you saw your demo, de demonstration of that in a minute. But uh, when you're working on, students are working on exercises, the system automatically gives them feedback and uh, that essential feedback and then all the exercises can be tried immediately again if they do them wrong. You can you just get a little bit different numbers, numbers for the exercises. And, uh, and this means that because they are all automatically assessed, you save as a teacher a lot of times, a lot of time, uh, for assessing and that time can be used, for example, to support your students. And also the learning analytics, as we mentioned before, we talked about before, are essential so that you understand the students, your students better, you know where they are struggling, you know where they have difficulties and so on. And uh, as we've seen, if you're using a system that gives you way more feedback that gives you way more exercise then it's definitely going to see can definitely going to be so up in the in the as improvement in grades so if you take a look at the edit and playground how does it actually work uh, the idea in general is that if you use it in at least when you use it in a classroom and even if you use it remotely maybe is that you replace at least, at least one of your math lessons a week with Edison Playground. So you keep on working with your exercise books as you did before, but instead of doing the exercise books only, one of the weekly lessons is replaced with the digital version where you use Edison Playground. Now, uh, 
you're going to need uh, an account as a teacher. And uh, if you haven't already created it, you can create it today. If you don't know how, you can ask in the, in the WhatsApp group. I can show you the address once more before we get the system. And then all the, the, all the students need their own accounts as well. But when you have a teacher account in the Edison Playground, you can create the student accounts yourself quite easily. And I'm going to show you how in a minute. Then you create a known course for each of the grades. So if you're teaching several grades, then each of those grades has their own course. Uh, and each course contains lessons. <clears throat> there are around 40 lessons in each of those weeks, each of those courses, sorry. Would be actually a bit more. And then you're going to use one to three lessons for each week. And uh, each of those lessons contains 25 to 30 exercises. And a single exercise contains multiple calculations normally, could be up to 10 or something like that. Uh, and then when the students are working on the system, they achieve virtual trophies, which we talked about the gamification before. It's essential that the students get some kind of reward when they're working hard. So typically when they do some amount, like half of the exercises, they get a bronze trophy. And when they work a bit more, they get a silver trophy, then a gold trophy. And then the diamond one is the one they get when they have completed almost all of the exercises. Uh, and trophies are also something you use as a teacher to set the goals for students. Something like uh, in this lesson, you need to complete at least a bronze trophy or you need to do enough exercises to complete at least a bronze trophy, and then the lesson is completed. And most of the times the students, on our experience, are not going to stop when they have completed the bronze trophy. They want to do it more. They want to get the silver trophy. They want to get the gold trophy. They want to get the diamond one. And this is strangely true for, for students in, in elementary school and for students in university as well. Uh, when you're using Edison Playground during school closer, and now this is an example something you could do. You could have your own plan. And uh, if you have your own routines, it's a good idea to try to embed the Edison Playground into your own routines as closely as possible. But this is like an example. Uh, so on Monday, you open a new lesson. The students start to work on the lesson. And before they start, you use a video conference tool to provide instructions. You maybe teach them a new topic. If, they, if the topic is something they haven't been working before, you tell them the things they need to know. You maybe show them some exercises, so how to solve them. And uh, then, of course, and even actually before that, you can check the previous lesson's progress, or then it can be part of the Monday routine that you see how well everyone is doing and see if some of the students have, have done really well on the previous week and maybe uh, announce that somehow, reward them in front of other, other students, something like provide positive feedback, which is really essential. Then starting from that one on Tuesday, the students work on the new, new lesson. And uh, at the same time, they may have some traditional math exercises with exercise book and uh, pen and paper. And then on the Wednesday, you can open a new lesson. If you decide you want to use two lessons each week, which might be a good idea in, in remote work. So again, the same routine we had on Monday, the students start to work on the new lesson. You had a video conference where you provide sort of like a, like a lecture kind of video conference where you provide the examples. And of course, you can interact with the students and the students can help you or sort of solve some of the exercises during the video conference and so on. Uh, and then Thursday, again, the students work on the new lesson and uh, work with traditional exercises. And then Friday, they work on the previous lessons if you want to. And uh, during this whole time, you can follow students' learning progress all the time by using the learning analytics provided, uh, and then provide assistance immediately when you realize or when you find out that some of the students are struggling with the with, uh, concept. Uh, if you talk about average times, then on our experience, something like 30 minutes a day active learning in Edison Playground is probably something you should aim for. Uh, and uh, as is mentioned on this, 
example, it's a good idea to provide sort of a mixture between digital exercises and traditional exercises. You don't want to provide too much screen time for students, especially when they're working remotely, when there's going to be a lot of screen time anyway, a lot of time in front of computer. So I think it's a good idea to provide some traditional lessons and some digital lessons and create a perfect mixture that way. Uh, and why does it work? What are what are the reasons why we've been getting so so good results over there? Uh, one of the things is definitely that you know a lot more about your students' work than you do with traditional exercise books. And the reason for that is is that it can provide you all kind of statistics that are sort of difficult to provide when you're using traditional materials. You can, for example, you can easily see how long the students have been working in some of the materials. And actually, in Finland, a lot of the a lot of teachers during this remote working working weeks have uh, mentioned that these sort of low level learning analytics, something like a statistics where you can see that how long the students were actually working with material, are really useful. Because again. It's really difficult to observe because you're not on the same location. You're not on the classroom with your students. You don't know whether they are working with the material or whether they are doing something entirely else. And when you're using a digital system like Edison Playground, you get a statistic saying that this student spent this much time on this lesson during these days, which gives you an access and, and enables you to sort of provide feedback. And uh, I don't know if it seems that the students are not working, maybe provide some something else but like assistance or the find out or well you know uh, active learning is uh, definitely one of the important things in all digital systems and also in Edison playground this is something uh, it's well that's probably one of the sort of like oldest theories in in, in educational sciences is that when you do things yourself you learn them better but than by just reading about things or about or hearing about things. And that's something you do in school all the time. You teach the students something and then they can practice and try it on their own. And uh, the digital systems allow students to perform a lot of active learning. Uh, but the active le to active learning to be meaningful, you need to be able to get a lot of feedback. So if you don't know whether you're doing the things correctly or incorrectly, that's definitely going to decrease your motivation. But if you get the feedback all the time that, yeah, this one was correct, this one wasn't correct, but you can fix it by maybe doing this, then that keeps the students on, on working on the things. Uh, and then there's the gamification, which is also meant for increasing motivation. Uh, there's a huge amount of different kinds of exercises. There's more than 150 different exercise types, exercise and game types, uh, which means that you're not working, even if you're working on the same topic, if you're working on uh, multiplications, for example, you get a different kind of exercises with those sort of similar multiplication calculations, which keeps you definitely more motivated. Uh, and uh, if you look at the numbers, if you're using a digital system, the students are doing up to eight times more calculations compared to pen and paper. And those are calculations where they receive instant feedback. So whenever they perform a calculation, they get a feedback stating that this one was correct, this one was incorrect. And in a lot of cases, how to fix the incorrect calculations or incorrect routines as well. Uh, so, if you haven't done this already, and if you're interested in trying it out while I show you the demonstration, you can now get the teacher access by signing up in that address over there. And then you can log in by using the uh, username and password provided to you at, at playground.edutin.com. And I give you a minute to do this if you haven't, and then we're going to continue with the demonstration. Hope, hope you have the address written down. Okay, then I'm going to move on to 
Edutzen playground and we go into start our session and uh, or our demonstration sorry the session has been going on for almost an hour uh, i sort of recommend that you look what i'm doing instead of doing it yourself and then you can try this out immediately after this session there are a lot of support materials and instructions which you can access directly uh, from the Edutzen playground i will show it to you a bit later today how to so you, if you don't learn anything immediately after I saw you show it to you here, you can you can definitely get help. And also remember the WhatsApp group and, and things like that. Anyway, if you if you look at the student view first, and uh, this is like the basic view the students get when they access Edit and Playground. And uh, now this is sort of a, a blank view. I haven't completed anything as a student, but uh, what I got here are the open lessons. There's only one lesson open for me right now. It's from the first grade uh, and it's uh, number 10 and 10 pairs. So that's the topic we're trying to learn today. It shows me my trophies. I haven't collected any trophies yet, but if I have, the numbers are shown here. So it's sort of, again, the whole idea of gamification showing you how well you have progressed and uh, and uh, you can also see how close you are to the next trophy when you start start doing the exercises. And it also shows your weekly activity. It shows how well you did in uh, previous weeks, which is, again, sort of important for students to, to see how much they have been working, especially if they're doing well and they can see that they've done more work in, in, in last week than they have in weeks before. That If they see that that one actually leads to better results, then it's definitely useful. Let's look at some of the exercises if I open the first lesson. And uh, now I can see the trophies in here. Whenever I do the exercise, I get some points and the bar over here grows uh, one exercise at a time, so one, well, many points I get at a time, and then I get closer to bronze trophy and then silver trophy and so on and so on. So whenever you do the exercise, you can see that the bar grows a bit longer and you're a bit closer to your next trophy. And uh, if we start with the, the very first, very simple exercise, it's, uh, it's a puzzle exercise. It's something sort of get you started with the first lecture. So we try to, hopefully this isn't too difficult for me, try to come up with number 10. And when we complete it, we submit it and uh, yeah, we get the full point. And we see that the bar started growing. We are a little bit closer to the first trophy. Then I can go to next exercise if I want to, or I can go back to the list where I can select the next exercise. And the whole point is that the students don't need to work on the exercise on exercises on the same exact order. They can start wherever they want. And uh, again, you as a teacher set the goals. You can say something like, well, the bronze trophy is typically a good goal, but the students can do whatever exercises you have given them to complete that, that goal. So it might mean that you need to complete all the exercises visible here, or you need to complete half, however you want it. Uh, and uh, if you look at some of these other exercises, some of them are sort of game-like exercises. So, for example, in this one, again, you need to remember this is the first grade exercise. So we just select a given number. So we are, we are learning numbers. We are trying to... Uh, learn to distinguish the numbers from letters and learn to distinguish the numbers from, from other numbers, learn what the numbers look like. So here's number seven. Here. I need to select seven here and then I can move on to next round and so on. If I want to play, don't want to play this to the end, I can just submit it. I get some points. I didn't get all of them because I didn't complete all of the tasks. But I get some points and again, my grade grows a, a bit larger. I'm a bit closer, closer to the do the actual actual trophy uh, <clears throat> then uh we have some exercises with uh some uh voice or or sounds in them some speeds over them and uh, now this is an important thing in a lot of the exercises in edit and playground the students can choose their talents level themselves uh, so you can pick an easy a medium or hard version of the same exercise. As a teacher in the learning analytics, you can see what the student selected. You can actually see that for each student, you can see that this student over here selected easy exercise 
for for this exercise number four or hard exercise for another exercise. But again, the idea is to let the do students also differentiate themselves. And this also might give you some some kind of idea on, on how well they are performing. If a student keeps on selecting hard exercises, then they probably know the topic rather well. If they only select the easy ones, then it's possible that they, they're having maybe some problems over there or then it's that they just want to want to select the easy ones. And in that case, you can probably provide some assistance. I'm going to be brave here and select the difficult ones. Let's see how this goes. I hope you can hear the sound. So I, so I click on the sound button over there and it says three plus five. I hope the, I don't know if you can actually get the sound sound over there over the stream, but Clicking the button, cells is three plus five. I can type in answer over here by using the keyboard over here or by using the keyboard on my computer. And again, if you're working on a tablet, for example, or you know, in an iPad or something like that, then this on-screen keyboard makes things a lot easier because I'm just typing eight from here. And then I can check my answer. And in this case, that was correct. So three plus five is eight, right? Uh, and then we get a bunch, and all of these exercises contain a number of calculations. And then in this case, there are 10 of them, again, displayed in this sort of another progress bar in here. I'm the second one now. So the second one is three plus six. And again, these are random calculations, uh, meaning that after the student has completed the exercise, he or she can retake the exercise immediately, and then he or she gets a bit different calculations. So. Uh, if you don't know something, it's easy to try it again because you don't get the same exact exercises, you get the same exact calculations, you get a bit different different numbers, so it's meaningful to do it again. Now I forgot what was the question. So it's three plus six. Let's see, I'm going to answer incorrectly for this one. I'm going to say that's eight. And uh, so uh, now it tells me that I didn't get this one correctly, but I can see what the correct answer would have been. So it would have been nine instead of my answer, which was eight, uh, which is, again, it's important feedback. And in the more complicated uh, tasks, you can actually get a lot more feedback about how to, how to solve the, cal the task or calculation or something like that. But even in the simple ones, it's a good thing that you can get the correct answer. And then you can try this again whenever you want to. I can reset the exercise and try it again from the beginning. And now I, and now I get different calculations. Now this time the first one is 4 plus 4, which is 8, and, and so on and so on. Okay, let's see one more. I get back to lesson. I'm not going to save my progress on this one. And uh, as a final one, let's see this racer exercise. Again, as I said, the idea is that uh, we're working on 10 pairs uh, and we're working on, on small numbers, but we, we have sort of similar calculations, but different tasks, which keeps the things more motivation, motivational. So uh, here's the instructions on how to use this. Again, I can do this with my keyboard or I can do this on my, if I'm using an iPad or something, there are on screen buttons, I can, I can click play it. And then the idea is that we want to, we need to form 10 pairs. So uh, there's a six number displayed on there and I need to pick the number so that I get the 10 as a sum. So six plus four is 10, I'm going to there. And two plus eight, that's also 10. And so, so it gives, the idea is to practice to find out what number with that number over there. If I select an incorrect lane, then the bar stops over there. If you look at the uh, uh, screen on the top right corner over here, uh, I lost one of my hearts, one of my sort of lives. But since there are four more left, I can and, and and practice this again. And then five and five makes ten and nine. And one makes ten and can also drive faster. And, Again, if I make a mistake, and I can keep on going as long as I have those lives left, or as or until I've completed the whole task. Again, there are variating amount of exercises or calculations inside a single exercise, but I think in this one there are probably ten or fifteen. 10 
tasks to complete. Uh, so this is what it looks like for students. So it's it's really simple to get started with students. You log into the system, you select a lesson, and usually there's only one lesson to select, the one you set up visible as a teacher, and then you start working on the exercises. And you keep on working. If at any point a uh, student struggles, it's easy to send feedback directly from the system. Let's click on the bits bubble over there and, and click on I'm so it see you a bit late, sir. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, but let's get back to the teacher view and so how this thing works for teachers. So that view was for students. And now if you look at the front page for teacher, this is actually really similar than the one we saw for the students. There are the same exact components over here. And uh, if you log in for the first time, it's going to ask you to create a new course and it's going to ask you to copy the existing material. I can do it later if I want to by clicking on this, opening this menu over here and selecting new course. And uh, then it gives me all the uh, courses you know, in the curriculum where I can select one and then copy the course and create a new course for me with all the material. So you need to do that before you start. And you're going to select a course with curriculum that fits your, your students. If you're working with fourth grade, select the fourth grade curriculum and so on. Uh, and actually at this point, I think it's a good idea to say that uh, if you're from Mexico, Ecuador, Chile, Argentina, or Peru, uh, then there are our local partners in the WhatsApp chat. You can ask for, for they contact information so if you want to get started in those country countries you can actually get like a hands-on hands-on guidance on how to use the system yourself so it's definitely a good idea and if your country wasn't mentioned over there then just you can send the your questions to whatsapp anyway we'll provide you with assistance when needed <clears throat> okay but back to basics so the idea is that here are all the grades that are available in this course now, in this demo course, there are only nine grades, but in actual courses, you get something more than 40, 40 lessons. And then I can select which lessons are visible to students by clicking on the eye icon over here. So if I want to so show the geometry lines, triangles, and uh, so on round, I select the eye icon, or lesson eye icon over there. Or if I want to show the lesson with divisibility and factors, I click the eye icon over there, and all the lessons with blue eye over there are shown to students. We can actually take a look. So if I log in as a student, there are now these two lessons visible for me. So the basic idea is that before the digital lesson start, you select which lesson is the one the students are going to work on, and then you set that as a visible lesson. And uh, usually there can be more than one lesson they can be like last week's lesson if they want if you want your students to keep keep on working on that that one and, and so on uh, and uh, that's basically what you need to do each week just click on one of those icons just select what topic you want to show to your students uh, some of the things you need to know and, and before you get started you need to add your students to the system and you do it by there's this toolbar on the top right corner where are these icons where you can select different views on the other side if you select the third one from the left the users you get the, uh, this view which displays all the users all your students and all your assistant teachers in your course and then you click the add students over there you get a list and all you need to do is type in the names of the students in here that's going to write some names over here and then I click next and what happens is that uh, you get uh, the user accounts created. Uh, I can click next and then I can select the type of password I want if I'm happy with the easy passwords which for more smaller students are are definitely fine. I can select create accounts and uh, for me, it asks me to select a school. That's because I have plenty of schools because I'm working working on with in different different countries with this one. But for you, you don't get that kind of dialogue. Then you get all the all the 
accounts in here. And this is a list which you can then print out and share with your students. I mean, one one account for each student. So now Henko can use this username and password, or Erki can use this username and password, and so on, to actually access the system. So that's all it takes to create the account. And once you have created an, an account for a student, that same account works for any courses they take in Edutain Playground. So they don't need to have a new account when they start a new course or new grade or anything like that. The same one works. And the students can, of course, change their passwords and, and however, however they want to. Uh, OK, so you create your students the accounts. You open the lessons you want to in the dashboard, in the front page, so where you can get by clicking the little house icon over there or the editing logo in the top left corner. And after that one, your students start, start working on and what's left for you is to see how well they are doing. And uh, I'm going to show you uh, uh, some demo data because I naturally I can't show you any, any data from actual students. Uh, so this is what your front page, teacher front page might look like when you have been using the editing for some time, uh, for a little while at least. So my students in this course have collected this many trophies, 105 diamond trophies. So I think it's perfectly fine. There are none this week's week. And uh, I can select the Guardian report for all the parents if I want to here or generate diplomas. But uh, what I'm interested in now is, is the office, the student diligence graph, which I found out as an excellent tool to found, find how the students are actually working. So what it means is that uh, there's the score the students have collected and there's the time they have been using in the system. Uh, so it means that this student over here has collected 5,700 points in 27 hours and 27 minutes. And if the, if the students are sort of close between this line over here, they use more time, more points, that's what you want. If a student is over here, it means that... Uh, they have collected a lot of points in a sort of a short time, which means that the exercises has, have probably been a bit too easy. And uh, if the students are somewhere over here, it means that they have been using a lot of time, but haven't collected that many points. And that means that the exercises are probably a bit too difficult. So this is like a quick overview on how your students are doing. You don't get the details. You get the details if you want to later. But if you don't, uh, then this is like a, this is actually a really useful tool. It's a quick glance on how your students in your class are, are, are doing at the moment. And then you can check on the check on the last activity when the student was last uh, locked in the system, what's happening this week, how many achievements the students have collected and so on. But if you want to take a closer look at analytics, you can click on the analytics uh, tab over there. And then we get more detailed access to what's happening in the whole classroom or with individual students. So we see in that for this lesson, which I've selected over here, I can select over here, multiplication. Uh, the students have been using, in on average, 5 minutes and 35 seconds. There have been two active students, 76% accuracy on the submitted tasks. Uh, and on average, a single student has comp completed 97 tasks. And uh, then there's list for all students where I can see each student's accuracy and score and, and what level they have been playing, or what level, what score, trophies they have achieved and how many, with, in what level they have been playing. So this student has selected five easy tasks and the moderate or hard tasks and so on. And if I want, I can get into a lot of details. I can uh, select a single student from here if I want to, and then I, I can take a look at the, on that student's progress in a really detailed level. I can I can check down to individual exercises, individual calculations, and how much time was spent in, in all the all the tasks and so on. So, so uh, that's basically it, and uh, that's all you need at this point. So what you need to do, if we sort of recap, you create your accounts on this user tab, you open a lesson in the dashboard, and then your students start working on, and then you just follow their progress in the learning analytics section. So that's all it takes. That's not too difficult. And that was one of the things 
I talked about earlier. So whichever, whichever tool you comp, uh, sort of choose, it, whether it's edit and playground or something different, choose something that's easy to adapt, something that doesn't require like hours of work to get something, something going on. Because there are a lot of new things you need to learn. You need to learn and your students need to learn when you're working on working on remotely for the first time. Okay, so that's it about the demonstration and a couple of more things I want to mention before we are done for today. So once again, if you didn't get the address for teacher access, you can just write it down now. So you can get your teacher account, your username and password over there so you can access the edit and playground the system I just showed you showed you before you can start your free trial. Yes. Uh, and uh, then you can go to playground.editon.com to log in at the system. And uh, things you want to do when you're actually getting started with the students. Uh, as we said before, as I said before, uh, routine and structure are important. Uh, so if you're using Editon Playground or any other digital tool, set a fixed time every week. So it's a, again, it's a routine. It's something like we work on this Editon Playground exercises on Monday, Monday and Wednesday or on each Friday or something like that. But something that students know that on this day, I'm going to be working on this system. Or you could do some work each day. Then again, it might be a good idea to be something like this is the system we're going to work on at noon each day or something like that. And uh, may set the goals, something we started this presentation with before you start, before you open a new lesson, make sure that all of your students understand that which trophy they need to collect this week. Is it the bronze trophy or is it something more? And uh, recognition and positive feedback, again, something I mentioned before, are really important. So it's if a student is doing well, Mention that and maybe do that in front of the class. Uh, students who are getting better trophies than bronze and maybe students who are usually not doing that well, but have done really sort of exceptionally well in, in, in some of weeks, recognize them in front of class, provide positive feedback, mention that they, that was a really good work. That was done some, definitely something extraordinary. Uh, and uh, also, I think it's a good idea that if you're using a digital system, then the trophies have some kind of impact on assessment. Uh, however, you want to decide, but something like if you collect enough gold trophies, you get uh, this much better grade or something like that. And uh, finally, I think it's essential that when the students are collecting the trophies, you communicate that to parents. You tell that your student did really well here, your student have collected this many trophies, or that your student didn't do that that well during this time, we expected a bit more. So things you would communicate to parents as well. And uh, actually something, something I want to show you. Again, in Edit and Playground, there's this uh, little bubble over here, which you can click and if you select uh, report an issue and the student can send a message which you will receive and we will receive in Edit and Play account. And this is again the, thing, the communication thing I mentioned before. So uh, if a student is having a problem in one of the exercises, he or she can immediately write you a message. And as a teacher, when you click the same bubble, you can see the messages sent by your students in here. So you can see that there's a student, whatever his or her name is, who is having problems with this exercise. Now these kinds of exercises, and then you can help, help him or her to perform better. So it's easy communication. You don't need to use your phone. You need to do, need, don't need to do anything excessive. Just click a single icon, type in your message, and, and that's it. OK. <clears throat> and uh, if you think about the first lesson, what you need to do, as a, again, as a summary, you create the accounts, and then you send the accounts to students. And this you need to do only once for each class. So each student gets a single account, like the username and password. And then you start with whatever topic you choose. And I think it's a, it's a good idea to start with the topic the students already know. So instead of trying to beat a new topic in the beginning, 
let them learn to how to use the system by providing something they have already practiced with. They, they will they will get some more practice on the topic that definitely doesn't harm them. But, uh, it's also uh, an easy way. Again, we talked about the cognitive load, a little less cognitive load because they know the topic and then they can focus on, on learning the ropes of the new system. So for the first lesson, uh, the actual objective is to use is learn to use edit and playground and after that one you can use the same system to learn the new topics again with any digital tool i think this is a good idea start with a familiar topic and then you spend the first lesson to learn to use the tool and then remember to set the goal straight and remember to explain how the system works there's a new lesson for each week and uh, you need to get a trophy from that lesson and use your video conference system to show what the trophies mean and where the students can see them and where they can see how close they are to the trophy and uh, make sure that everyone understands what trophy they are aiming for each week. And then for each week, uh, you open just one new lesson or you might want to open two lessons because if you're only working remotely, you might want one. I want to use some more content, but don't open all the lessons. That's uh, that's a confusing and that's not a clear call to set. That's like too much to choose from. It's a good idea to open at least in the beginning one or two lessons a week and then provide clear, clear goals to achieve. And uh, again, as I said before, make sure every student knows that they have to achieve a trophy for next week lessons. Uh, and after a couple of weeks, this becomes a routine. So, so you can pay less attention to this when the students realize that it's the same, same sort of routine each week that we, there's a new lesson and you need to achieve the bronze trophy or the silver trophy or whatever trophy you decide. Uh, and as a teacher, observe how the students are doing. Check that they have completed their homework and now most of the work they be doing is homework because they're mostly working from home or almost uh, solely working from home. Uh, and uh, so check that they, how they are doing, check if they have any problems in any of the topics, get uh, accustomed and familiarize yourself with the learning analytics view. There are a lot of information you can get from individual students. So check that at least every few days, I think it might be a good idea to spend like five minutes or a couple of minutes might be enough each day to lock in the system and just get an overview of the statistics. Uh, and finally, so we're getting close to our session over here. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm the head of research in, in Edison and uh, what we are is uh, a spin-off of University of Turku, which is a global rank of one university in Finland. And, uh, we are working closely with the University of Turku and with the University of Helsinki, where I'm, I'm working in addition to Edison at the moment. And what we are working on in addition to Edison Playground is the Finland math, which is a pedagogical concept about how to teach math the Finnish way, wherever you're teaching it. Uh, and if you talk about Edison Playground in Finland, it's the most popular, popular digital math tool uh, it's actually used in 45% of, of all schools, in, so almost half of the schools in Finland use Edison Playground. And uh, that's important because in Finland, the teachers can select the tools themselves. So all the teachers can select what tools they want to use. And uh, so I think it's important to remember something we are really proud of is that uh, the teachers in Finland voted Edison Playground as their favorite tool, as the best tool for digital learning just last year. So uh, if you're interested to learn more, uh, I think a good idea is to, you will probably get these slides, but to go to edutent.com. And uh, also actually one more thing I want to show you is that uh, when you look into Edutent Playground and if you want to <laughs> learn more, you can also always click on the top right corner with your initial in it and then click on the support section. And there are all the instruction materials. There are guides for how to do things in here. There are these slides, these training slides. Uh, <coughs> there are guides to how to use it in general, how to create electronics. Uh, 
digital X, uh, electronic exams here, and uh, uh, there are some videos you can you can take a look so how to use Edutin and what it's all about, and so on. And also, if you're interested in Finland math, you can open the Finland math guides directly here from Edutin, Edutin Playground. And whatever more you want to use, you can always go to eduten.com or send us an email on support at eduten.com, and we are more than happy to answer any questions you might have. Whether it's about Edison Playground or about Finland Math or about digital pedagogy, pedagogy in general. So, uh, I think we have one more slide to go, which is for me to say thank you to all for listening. I, have, I know that there were a lot of you. I didn't see the final numbers because I've been uh, talking to you, but uh, if there's anything you want to ask me about the presentation or want to discuss or, or maybe you're interested in, in doing some research or anything like that, feel free to send me an email at erki at, at edutent.com or you can use the support at edutent.com, whatever, you can, you can reach me anyhow. So I hope you got something out of this one. So whether you want to try out Edutent Playground or whether you're using a, uh, some kind of other digital tool, I hope that you found this presentation somewhat useful. And uh, so I thank you for listening and uh, hope that you have a really sort of fruitful remote lessons up ahead of you. Thank you very much.